So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the first session of the afternoon. And it's my pleasure to introduce Joel Moore from Berkeley, who will be telling us about how wave function geometry helps explain the electromagnetic response of solids. Please, Joel. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for the chance to be back here. Um, it's great to see a lot of people I haven't seen for years and to meet some new people. Uh, I hope everyone will come back to ICTS in the future. So this talk is maybe close in spirit to what Martin Claussen talked about, um, but it also touches on some of the topological objects that you heard about in the pedagogical lecture. Uh, the basic idea is that the topology of wave functions we sort of know is important for things like the quantum Hall effect that are very precisely quantized because they're sort of adiabatic processes. Uh, but the same or at least closely related geometrical objects, and I'll remind you what those are at a not very technical level, um, turn out to be very important for electromagnetic responses of solids, uh, by which I mean not just low frequency stuff, but even optical properties at finite frequency. And for the last five or 10 minutes, I might talk about something else, but most of this talk will be how topology of wave functions matters even for optical properties and even in experiments. And in particular, there's an effect you can at least hope to see, and maybe signs of this have been seen in experiment. I wouldn't say it's been completely seen, but it's like a generalization to nonlinear optics of the famous quantum Hall effect. So if I ignore spatial indices, I could write the ordinary quantum Hall effect as E squared over H times electric field gives me a current. If you were just trying to imagine, well, what could happen with two powers of electric field, say, and no material dependent constants, you might be led to conjecture some sort of equation like this just by power counting, um, finding a case where that might actually happen and, and why you might care uh, is maybe the first and main part of the talk. Um, so the theoretical idea for this, oops, sorry, uh, does go back a few years, but I'll talk about things that we understood only more recently. No, it's good, yeah. Um, but as a result of the original theory work being some years ago, these are former Berkeley people now scattered around the world. And the experiments I'll show about are, are down here. And then the more recent work um, I'll talk about toward the end, I don't have pictures of these people, but uh, Alex is my graduating student. Vlad is a postdoc who left recently and went to Carnegie Mellon and Kazuaki Takasan is a postdoc who's now back in Tokyo. So the quick introduction, um, and it will be quick, feel free to interrupt if there's something that I need to explain more, but uh, we now have about 40 years of examples of how topological materials, if you like, do interesting things when you measure them either in transport or optics. Uh, and there are many ways to analyze topological materials, but one that is fairly concrete and connected to things that physicists think about a lot are so-called Berry phases. Um, and then you can ask, well, what if we get away from insulators and low frequency, which is where we usually look for topology, and try to find examples where it might control physics, um, even in a pumped system or a system at least driven to the nonlinear regime or to finite frequency or whatever. Um, and that's been a big growth area. You've all, I think, heard about Floquet topological phases earlier in this meeting. Um, you can derive much of what I'm doing using a Floquet approach, although I won't go through the details of that. Um, the particular effect I'm going to talk about, and I'll build up to why we started caring about it basically 13 years ago, is a sort of chiral photocurrent. Um, and when we first cared about it 13 years ago, we thought it was seen experimentally uh, but sort of boring, um, not too boring, but moderately boring. And now we think it's somewhat seen experimentally in the regime we care about, but uh, a lot less boring. Um, but the general things I, I, that might be useful to keep in mind, and I'll come back to at the end, is that basically, I think it's always going to be true that in metals, in gapless systems, um, quantization is not nearly as protected as it is in insulators. Uh, so why that's true will sort of come up toward the end, but it's a question that you might be tempted to ask. Um, so even in the best possible metals, which are point semi-metals like graphene in 2D or vial Dirac semi-metals in 3D, um, they're still not quite as good as insulators in terms of protection, but they have other advantages you might care about. Um, then I'll say a bit about optical driving with strong correlations. So the good or bad news about the first part of the talk is that you can sort of understand what's going on with free electrons and then treat interactions as a perturbation. But a lot of people, including a lot of people here, think more about truly strongly correlated systems. Um, there's been a lot of interesting work in one spatial dimension in the last 10 years or so. Um, and we have a particular thing that I think is a feasible experiment that I hope someone will actually do. So that's the last 10 minutes that I said, or last five minutes maybe, which is in a different spirit. So now the sort of lightning introduction. But first of all, if you are inclined to believe that 
there will never be anything even roughly quantized in a metal. Uh, here's a simple counterexample, which is probably the easiest way to measure the fine structure constant of the universe, uh, as long as you have a friend who can give you a big sheet of graphene. Um, so if they give you the graphene, you hold it up to the light, and you realize that most of the light gets through. And if you, if you put in a few more sheets, you could figure out how much does one sheet of graphene block? And the answer is it blocks about 2.3% of visible light. And that 2.3% is pi times 1 over 137. In other words, the fine structure constant with the real speed of light, the speed of light in vacuum, not the speed of light in graphene. Um, and that's not super protected uh, either to interactions or disorder. Um, you might wonder, well, why do you even see this rough quantization? It's maybe one part in 100. Uh, it turns out that interactions are anomalously small. There's just a number that turns out to be small, and graphene is not very disordered. Um, it's not really you know, protected either at low frequency or high frequency. Once the bands start to bend at an electron volt, you lose it. Um, but at least it shows you that sunny metals are where you might look for some kind of quantization in metals. Um, so is there a nonlinear version of that was one of the questions that motivated us. Um, but there's actually kind of a broader reason why you might care about these new vial semimetals and in particular about nonlinear optics of vial semimetals. Um, so first of all, you know, something that people have known as a theoretical possibility for a very long time, and I'll define what it is later on, but basically in the early days, right after Dirac equation, Vial pointed out that you could actually have massless fermions um, that would be like you separated the left-handed and right-handed parts of a normal Dirac fermion. Um, unfortunately, uh, these do not seem to exist in particle physics. At least we've never managed to discover a Vial fermion. Uh, we thought the neutrino might be one, but then neutrinos oscillate, so they have mass, so they're not Vial fermions. Um, condensed matter does have Vial electrons. Uh, the first electronic Vial semimetal was tantalum arsenide, discovered around 2014 or so. Um, and even though this doesn't have the right symmetries for the effect that is topological, it does already have extremely strong nonlinear optics. In fact, even to the point where you can use this in applications. When you go to other vial semimetals, and I'll explain why you would go to other ones, um, you get an, an optical effect that is not only strong, but roughly quantized. At least it has a natural scale that is material independent. And finally, uh, linear optics turns out not to be very special in vials. And that was something that we also spent uh, a long time investigating, as did other people. I will quickly present the sort of no-go result, but not spend much time on it later on. Um, so now the, the five minute introduction to why you might care about topological phases. So as you probably all heard in 1980, people realized that something weird must be going on in two dimensional electron gases in a strong magnetic field. Because when you do the standard semiconductor Hall measurement, you run a current one way and you measure how much voltage develops transverse to it because of the magnetic field. You normally expect a straight line dependence on magnetic field like this red curve. But as the magnetic field gets larger, you get these very flat regions which are flat to incredibly high accuracy. And in fact, this was recently used to sort of redefine the standard of units because you can take a big chunk of material with defects and so on. It could be gallium arsenide or graphene, or whatever. Um, and you will all agree on what E squared over H is. Uh, as far as I know, this is about the only application of topological materials yet is redefining units. If anyone knows another one, I would, I would love to hear it for the purposes of grant introductions, uh, but that's one that is out there already. Um, likewise, the Josephson effect, which is also kind of topological, lets you measure E over H. So with two big solid state measurements, you get E and you get H. Um, so that's the topology background. The optical background, uh, and maybe this is sort of a general statement, not just optics, but one thing to keep in mind is that the symmetry analysis you find in classics like Landau and Lifshitz is not wrong. It's still true that symmetry tells us whether an effect can be there or not. And in general, if it's allowed to be there, it should be there. Um, what topology sometimes does is tell you that the magnitude is special. The magnitude is particularly universal and maybe not as dependent on details. And I think a lot of the old optical effects that we sort of knew about, and even older things like polarization and so on, um, the symmetries of those were understood a long time ago, but what property of a material controls the polarization wasn't understood until Berry phases. That was worked out by people like David Vanderbilt. So anyway, uh, the symmetries that matter for optics. Well, if you want to put in light at omega at one frequency and get out light at two omega, that's second harmonic generation. And that requires a material that doesn't have a center of inversion. So for example, gallium arsenide breaks inversion, 
but in bulk, it's not polar. It doesn't have a particular direction, which is what polar means. If you have a preferred direction, then for example, light could shine on your material and current would run along that direction. So if you wanna make like a single phase photovoltaic, bulk photovoltaic effect, you wanna be polar. And then chiral materials, you could think of those as left or right-handed. Uh, I don't want any mirror symmetries, basically. Um, those have optical rotation without breaking time reversal symmetry. So something like a Faraday effect, but not magnetic, it's called natural optical activity. So anyway, this is kind of the interaction between symmetry and topology is the point of this slide. So very briefly, uh, one way to understand the Berry phase is that the adiabatic theorem that you learned as an undergraduate maybe is not quite complete. If you do adiabatic evolution where you change a Hamiltonian slowly and you remain in the same state, as long as a gap doesn't close, that's true. But it turns out that if you brought the Hamiltonian around a closed path in parameter space, you would build up a phase that is actually part of the phase is actually measurable and independent of how rapidly you moved along the path. That's this geometric phase. And you can write it in something like an integral of a vector potential or connection in parameter space. And for us, the parameter space is just momentum. And in fancy language, um, there is a U1 gauge invariance. One reason why this is a natural thing to do is <clears throat> you and I might disagree on the phase of the wave function at some value of the parameter, or we might disagree at every value of the parameter. As long as we disagree smoothly though, that will be like a gauge transformation, uh, transformation by a gradient of the Berry connection. And that means that the curl of A is your first guess at something that might be physical because that's just like the magnetic field in electrodynamics, it's gauge invariant. And indeed, this is maybe the simplest and, and still possibly the most important of these wave function quantities, the Berry curvature. And now there are a few examples where what matters, uh, and this appeared, I think, in Martin's talk, is actually sort of off diagonal parts of the connection when I've got multiple bands that are degenerate or could be degenerate. That's the non abelian Berry phase. It just means extra indices and UN instead of U1. All right, so the way this all matters in solids, if we remember that we've got, you know, Bloch's theorem, that says that as a function of momentum, uh, I've got some block states that basically tell me what the wave function is doing inside the unit cell. Um, and from those, I can make the Berry phase. It's like there's a magnetic field living in the Brillouin zone of every crystal. And if I integrate that field over a two-dimensional Brillouin zone, it has just the right units to give me an integer, a so-called churn number. And the people who pointed out what that churn number means, the reason why we also call it TKNN integer, um, pointed out that that two-dimensional churn number that a band might have, basically the integral of its very curvature, tells me that if I were to put electrons in that band, I would get the churn number's worth of E squared over H when I do that quantum Hall effect measurement. So something I can measure to incredibly precise accuracy is determined by this topological invariant. And the way Thales and all figured this out was basically Laughlin had the first argument that the quantum Hall effect would be quantized, but it wasn't really a standard way of computing transport. It was this adiabatic pumping process. So Thales and collaborators set out, you know, by doing ordinary Kubo formula calculations, could we understand Laughlin's result? And it is just ordinary current current correlators and a bit of work give you that formula. So now I said 40 years had passed. Now we jump ahead to the present day. And in that time, we've learned that this Berry phase is hugely important for a lot of things in insulators. And uh, maybe until recently, it was thought to be moderately important for a small number of things in metals. Uh, in other words, insulators, there's a long list of stuff that we could talk about that's probably making its way into textbooks now. Um, when you go to metals, uh, I'll explain what is the classic example of Berry phase in metals, which is the intrinsic anomalous Hall effect, but why that might make you pessimistic about quantization or generality, um, at least in ordinary metals. Semi-metals are special. That's one of the messages, I guess. Um, so the reason why the Berry phase is, is generally important, um, one way to understand that, let me give one way to think about it in insulators and then talk about metals. Basically, this is the expression in detail for the polarization of an insulator in 1D, actually. Dowlis worked this out, and then Vanderbilt realized how general it was, I would say. Um, given those block states, I take some derivative and momentum space. This is that object I called A, and the loop integral of A sort of around the one-dimensional Brillouin zone, which is a circle, gives me the polarization. And it's ambiguous by charge, which is exactly how the polarization should work, it turns out. 
Anyway, we know that polarization has something to do with where charge sits in the unit cell. If I move charges left or right in the unit cell, that should modify the polarization. Um, and that's a clue as to where this might appear. So if I only looked at the energy band structure, like E of K, and I had a material that was time reversal symmetric, then E of K would be equal to E of minus K by time reversal symmetry, even if the material broke inversion. In other words, my claim is that if you just looked at band structure, E of K, you could not tell, leaving aside magnetic materials, uh, you could not tell if your material had broken inversion. So any physical quantity that is sensitive to inversion breaking, which would be polarization or nonlinear optics or other things, um, has to involve something other than the band structure. It often involves the Berry phase. Um, another thing it can involve is the orbital moment, which is closely related. Uh, but basically, there has to be information about the wave functions beyond what we normally see, and that's where the Berry phases come in. Um, and actually, that might be even more basic in metals, because uh, the biggest omission, I wouldn't really call it a mistake if you read their footnotes carefully, but it's at least an omission in Ashcroft and Merman, our classic solid state book, is that the semi-classical equations of motion only have the first term. Uh, they've got the group velocity, which is something that would happen if the electron is a point particle, the second term with the Berry curvature, so-called anomalous velocity, appears precisely because the electron is not a point particle. If you change the momentum of the electron, then the electron's wave function changes, its center of mass might move, and that's an extra piece of the velocity. So that's this. Um, and the example of where that matters historically is the anomalous Hall effect. So first measured by Hall back around 1890, and Karplus and Luttinger, the people who first discovered this, um, understood that it kind of had to be there for the Hall effect, but they didn't have Barry's elegant way of expressing and explaining things, so they were basically ignored for 30 years. So it's kind of a sad story, but eventually they won. Um, and win means that there is at least a region in magnetic metals like iron where we believe that the dominant contribution to sigma xy is from their term. Um, to be precise, if I look at sigma xy, so there's a reason why this axis is sigma xx. It's basically saying, I don't want a material that's too clean or too dirty. If I have a typical metal somewhere in here, then the Hall effect is dominated by the same integral that Thales was talking about, except it's not over the whole Brillouin zone, it's only over the occupied states, which makes sense because metal, you've only occupied part of the Brillouin zone in the conduction in the band at the Fermi level. Um, the point here is it's not, protected to disorder as well as the quantum Hall effect. If I make the system more disordered, it gets more, you know, I, I get dominated by hopping and things like that. If I make it very clean, it's dominated by sort of Fermi surface physics, but there's about three orders of magnitude in between where it seems to work. Although you can tell it's a hard problem because even after a hundred years, it's still at the level of a speculative and schematic phase diagram and that's figure 47. So you can tell it's uh, not the easiest thing. Um, but we got interested, is there an easier effect the reason why we first cared about the circular photogalvanic effect was, is there an easier effect where you don't need to do as much work of having like an intermediately disordered material to pull out the berry phase contribution? And the idea is something that was primarily measured by Ganachev's group, um, who have a very nice terahertz source. Uh, if you take, and it was measured for you know, 20 years or so, um, and we, we claimed that the theoretical interpretation of that was, was not quite right. It was actually a berry phase effect. And the reason is the following. So what's going on in these measurements, the circular photocurrent or circular photogalvanic effect means I shine right circular polarized light on a material and I get a current one way and I shine left circular polarized light and I get a current the other way. So it's an ordinary current, but it's sensitive, a photocurrent, but it's sensitive to the right or left circular polarization. So a way to picture that is you know, why this doesn't care about normal conduction. Let's just think about semi-classical motion of electrons where the black circle is the ground state and the gray circle is I push the electrons a little bit away and they reached a steady state between the applied field of the light and the scattering in the material. Um, so a slow circularly polarized light will kind of move the gray circle around the black circle and the ordinary velocity will average to zero, but the anomalous velocity if you have a material that breaks inversion, will not average to zero. So the claim was, and, and if you want the experimental, let me give some credit to the experimentalists because they had interpreted it in terms of spin orbit coupling for many years, but then they did the experiment in a sort of low symmetry form of silicon. And the effect was just as strong as in gallium arsenide, even though the spin orbit is much weaker in silicon. So they sort of knew that it couldn't be spin orbit. And we would claim that it doesn't really have anything to do with spin orbit. It's an orbital berry phase effect. 
Um, but it's not quantized and you know, we, it, people like Liang Fu and Inti Sodaman have worked a lot more on this effect, but uh, yeah, we, we paused, we didn't work on it for a while. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we, we wound up coming back to it for a totally different reason, which was the discovery of these vile semimetals. So Dirac said in particle physics language, you know, here's a nice relativistic equation for the electron. In condensed matter, we would interpret that as a possible description of a four band semimetal in 3D with linear dispersion. Um, in 3D, unlike 2D, uh, you can split the Dirac equation into two pieces if the particle is massless. Um, this is different from the splitting that Majorana did. This is a, a sort of relatively ordinary fermions. They're still standard fermions, not Majoranas. But if you like, they're massless and they have a definite handedness. The right and left handed decouple and live at different points in the Brillouin zone. Um, in a simple picture, you'd only have two. In tantalum arsenide, you actually have 24 of these vowel points, but it is indeed a vowel semimetal. Um, and the way these were found experimentally, it turns out, you know, Vial thought about this a long time ago, and, and Herring thought about how you would realize this in a crystal in the 1930s, but no one found an example. A good smoking gun was figured out in this paper, which pointed out that, well, I guess it was known that there's kind of a topological property of these vowel points. They're basically monopoles of the Berry flux, uh, but there's a consequence that there's a surface state, which is not a Fermi surface, it's a Fermi arc. Basically half the Fermi surface might live at the top and the other half lives at the bottom. And if you see that in photo emission, then you probably have a vial semimetal. So that was how these were discovered. But it'd be nice to know, you know, aside from some unusual surface state you can look for in photo emission, what are the consequences of having these sort of topologically charged vial points? Um, and there, uh, again, you know, something like this, because Dirac is, if you like, the two-dimensional vial semimetal. In 2D, vial and Dirac are the same thing, at least in my way of using the words. Um, so is there some 3D effect like that? And People spent a while looking first in linear and then in nonlinear terms. Um, the reason why you might hope for something interesting in nonlinear terms is one of the reasons why particle physicists cared a lot about the Val fermion, which is um, if you only had one Val fermion, one reason why they have to come in pairs is that one Val fermion would violate the conservation of charge. If you applied parallel electric and magnetic fields, you would create charge out of nowhere, um, which we suspect is a bad thing for condensed matter at least. So. Uh, that's why they come in pairs. That's the nilsson neomia theorem. Um, but you might expect that even if you had a pair, you might be able to use this effect that you can sort of use it to pump charge from one to another. What I'll talk about is a little bit different. It's two electric fields instead of that. And it's not, as far as I know, truly an anomaly. It's not as protected as an anomaly might be. So um, linear response, very briefly, is not special in vial semimetals. It's actually controlled by the orbital magnetic moment what I mean by not special is that in vial semimetals, uh, it's not that different from any chiral material. Uh, you could take quartz or selenium or whatever. Um, and the natural optical activity at low frequency in a metal is always governed by this funny object, which is the orbital magnetic moment of electrons in a crystal. And that's yet another modification to Ashcroft and Merman. It appears in the group velocity part. Whenever you're in a magnetic field, I'm telling you this because if I'd known this, it would have saved me something like a year of work. Uh, other people knew it around 2005, but somehow it never made it into my graduate education. You should modify the group velocity in the crystal in a magnetic field by adding the orbital magnetic moment of the electron, which is interesting because it can depend on K. So it's got a gradient and a modification of velocity. And that's actually you know, mo mostly not that important, but it, it is the only part that contributes at low frequency to natural, natural optical activity. Okay, finally. So now we go to nonlinear optics. This is the paper that showed even in tantalum arsenide, the simplest and first Val semimetal. Well, maybe not simplest, but first Val semimetal. Um, ordinary second harmonic generation is roughly 10 times larger than about anything else at a certain frequency. Um, studied in more detail since then. This was work of Joe Ornstein at Berkeley. Uh, this is the effect that I want to present briefly, um, and then show some experiments related to. So the idea is, let's go back to that circular photogalvanic effect and imagine a situation where I've put the Fermi level between two vial nodes. So I said there always have to be an even number, but they don't all have to be at the same energy. In particular, if you have a chiral material, they can occur at different energies. And then if you put the Fermi level in between and think about optical transitions, here you've got sort of low frequency optical transitions you can't 
cross the vowel point because the final state is occupied, that's polyblaking, blocking. Um, you would get the kind of 2010 physics we worked out for this point. But over here, you actually have optical transitions across the vowel point, which is a monopole of Berry flux. That's the picture. So does anything happen when you make optical transitions across a vowel node? Um, and as you probably guessed, I'm giving the talk because the answer is yes. The rate at which you produce current um, is essentially e squared over h times the intensity times an integer, which is the vowel charge of the point, and then some material independent constants. Um, so we had that. We proposed a material. Our material doesn't work. It's hard to grow as crystals and probably doesn't have a gap. Very soon afterwards, Ahita San's group found a new material that is sort of a, a multifold vial material. It's got a vowel point with charge four instead of one, which makes the effect stronger. So that's good. Um, and then some other theorists did a very detailed understanding of what should you see when you measure this quantized circular photogalvanic effect in rhodium psilocyte. In particular, um, this effect will turn off once the frequency gets large enough that you have transitions across this point as well. Then if you like, this node will appear and cancel out that node. So you ought to see a very odd nonlinear optical effect where it's strong until you hit the internode splitting and then it goes to zero, which is not the way that nonlinear optics normally works in metals. Um, this is one of three derivations I know of of the quantization. Uh, what might interest Floquet people is that Takehiro Morimoto, who developed sort of Floquet methods with Naga Osa as a way to calculate. But the main point of the slide, without going through the details, is it's just Fermi's golden rule for a Dirac point. If you just want to get the answer kind of lazily, that will give you the right answer. To prove it's kind of topologically protected requires a bit more. But if you want the basic idea of why it works is to say that a vowel point is topological means that even though you know, the initial states and the final states are not the point, they know that it's there because I couldn't get rid of the point locally. It has a kind of topological charge or stability. So in doing my integral over initial and final states with a bit of math, I can collapse that onto the calculation of the vowel topological charge. So it's interesting because finite frequency, you don't normally get so lucky, but it's very much like the Dowless et al. paper um, just for an optical property. You take the standard optical expression and you massage it and everything non-material dependent, sorry, everything material dependent drops out. So anyway, uh, this is how you do the experiment. You sort of shine a pulse of light with a laser that should create a brief pulse of current into the material and you measure the low frequency radiation from that brief current. Um, this is the paper where that's done. And what it looks like, so they couldn't really measure the magnitude and their laser cannot go to particularly low frequency. There is some later data by Liang Wu at Penn, but the basic point is there's a strong effect and then it suddenly turns off at around 0.7 EV, which is where the theory paper had predicted it would turn off. So at least the frequency dependence is very consistent with the model for what should happen. Um, there are some claims in later papers that the magnitude is maybe the right order of magnitude for E cubed over H squared, um, but I won't talk about that. Um, basically because uh, I don't know how accurately, I suspect that the magnitude should probably not be all that accurately quantized. Um, we did a calculation of, if you put on interactions, you know, is this like the quantum Hall effect, which is basically not modified by interactions, or is it more like things in metals, which usually are modified by interactions? And basically, there is a correction um, larger than the one in graphene, but not infinite or divergent or anything. We think there's a regular correction. Okay, the only divergence you might worry about is right at the edges, but I think that's just an artifact of perturbation theory. Anyway, the leading vertex correction um, gives you some level of correction. Uh, there are also likely corrections from disorder. Um, I think if you want to know more, you have to ask either Jed or Justin. Uh, so I think in general, I mean, if you like going back to here, you can already see that quantization won't be perfect because there's this other thing floating around as well, but that's usually a hundred times smaller. Uh, but the main point is there is a natural scale for this nonlinear optical effect, which is E cubed over H squared, and it gets perturbative corrections, at least the interaction correction is the one I know about. So anyway, I, I'm gonna skip over maybe future directions in optics. Uh, for a minute. Um, maybe the one thing that's worth talking about uh, for pumping is, I mentioned symmetry is very important for optical effects. Uh, you can use a laser pump to modify the symmetries of materials. In other words, if you're given a material that has inversion symmetry and therefore it doesn't have second harmonic generation, just run a current or run an intense pulse of light to create the current. And then you will create all the effects you want. And sometimes those are quite interesting. 
Uh, this is work with Kazuaki Takasan. So, and, and sort of motivated by an experiment at uh, Los Alamos. Um, so that's saying that if, if you're not given by nature the equilibrium material you want, then pumping lets you create the one you want. Um, and then for my last five minutes, you know, what I've talked about so far was first no interactions and then perturbative interactions. Um, but how can you use pumped systems to try to measure some of the exciting new physics that people have figured out, people including people here have figured out in one spatial dimension? I'm just focusing on one spatial dimension for now because there we can do very good theory and very good numerics compared to higher dimensions. So one example of an interesting fact that we know, uh, you know just to kind of motivate this, not the one I'll talk about, um, is that if you have integrable systems, like for example, the spin half Heisenberg spin chain, like in this material, potassium copper fluoride, uh, it turns out that at any finite temperature, the spin dynamics is not diffusion and not ballistic. Uh, this was originally suggested in 2019 um, by a group in Slovenia. Uh, the end result is actually uh, in between, if you like, if ballistic behavior is z equal to one and diffusion is z equal to two, z is the relative scaling of space scale and time scale. Um, this Heisenberg spin chain is z equal to three halves. Um, some properties of it, maybe not all, are in the Cardar Parisi Zhang universality class. And this is experimentally detectable, first in this solid state paper, but also in an optical lattice emulator. Uh, basically, you know, particles would move relatively fast if they're ballistic. They will move diffusively, like a random walk if they're diffusive. And the actual way that spin moves in the Heisenberg chain is this blue line. Um, so I want to talk about even non-integrable one-dimensional metals and claim that even those have a kind of super diffusion once you get away from linear response. In other words, once you drive. So this is a linear response property. In other words, even at linear response, you see weird effects in the Heisenberg chain because of integrability. Um, and they're, they happen in real materials. So it's not like they depend on absolutely perfect integrability, but the real world is often not integrable. So are there interesting 1D effects like super diffusion when you don't have integrability? And the answer is yes, if you can pump your system. Um, I won't talk about the second paper, except at the very end, which is sort of a holy grail um, that we took a shot at, um, but I think someone would need to push farther. Uh, the first one is, can we get super diffusion without depending on integrability um, and in, in a way that's kind of natural? So first, what, is, what do I mean by generic 1D metal? Uh, because this is something that uh, I feel there is occasionally confusion about in, in papers. So it's true that uh, the generic state of one dimensional interacting fermions, if they remain gapless, is not a Fermi liquid, it's a so-called Luttinger liquid. And the Luttinger liquid is effectively a free boson theory. So we, we say that the Luttinger liquid is a free boson plus irrelevant perturbations. The problem is that the moment you start thinking about dynamics, long time dynamics at any non-zero energy or temperature, the irrelevant perturbations actually matter. Um, basically, for thermodynamics and tunneling, the free boson acts, free boson limit is fine. When you start to think about transport, the free bosons would not scatter. They would be perfectly ballistic, um, but that's not really the right description. If you like, um, even if the relaxation from irrelevant perturbations is small, if there was no relaxation before, then a small amount of relaxation is not a small perturbation on zero relaxation. Um, so that's why uh, I think of uh, integrability breaking, which is always there in real Luttinger liquids, is sort of dangerously irrelevant. In other words, if you wait long enough, you will always see that you don't have the free boson. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking about how you could see this. And the basic claim is that if you take any one dimensional wire and you cool it, you know, you make it as low temperature as possible, and then you heat the middle and you watch the energy expand, or, you know, you could solve coupled equations if you want both energy and particles. But basically, if you're expanding into the ground state, you're never really in linear response and you will always get super diffusion. And even if you make a simple and not entirely correct model to get sort of a lower bound, you can sort of put a lower bound on the super diffusion and see that it's actually faster in DMRG. Um, so if you want the, the, the point of this little model is just, even if you perfectly thermalized, you would still be super diffusive because zero temperature, you might think that small, temper small temperature is a small difference from zero temperature and linear response would apply, but it's actually beta that matters, it's not temperature. So any small temperature is actually uh, not in linear response relative to zero temperature, 
for the Luttinger liquid. That's kind of the claim. Um, there's more detail in this PNAS and even numerics. And I think this ought to be a doable experiment. I don't know with atoms or condensed matter or whatever, but the claim is that actually super diffusion, if you can prepare cold one dimensional Luttinger liquids, super diffusion is almost generic when you heat up a point and watch it spread. Um, the second thing I thought I'd mentioned in my last eight seconds is uh, another big question in one dimensional transport where there hasn't been as much progress as in all the super diffusion stuff, um, but we tried. Uh, and I mentioned this in case someone else can go farther with it, basically. Uh, if you have one dimensional metal, or in fact, any metal, we know that like cuprates, for example, tend to have this linear T resistivity behavior. That's one of the non-Fermi liquid signs. And it's believed that that's maybe related to some kind of limit on what is the fastest relaxation time you can have, so-called Planckian dissipation. So now that we can do so much in 1D, you can try to build a model and see if there's really a limit h bar over kT on dissipation. Um, but we found it very hard to access that limit sort of numerically. But I'm very curious, you know, there are all these papers by Severe Sachdev and Jan Zahn and others. Um, can we, are we at the stage yet of understanding condensed matter enough that we can build a model and actually see that that limit, yeah, you know, in a controlled way, approach that limit and see it as a hard limit? Um, because there's a lot of theoretical arguments that there is some kind of limit on relaxation. So thank you for the, letting me do the five minute end. Uh, the main part of the talk, here's the quick summary. Um, Nonlinear optics and vials, let me focus on. Um, the point, I guess, is that ordinary metals are still not very quantizable in higher dimensions, but semi-metals are special, even when you're not right at the semi-metal point. Um, probably most vial materials have very strong nonlinear optics, but if you look at the right one, and there's a quantized nonlinear optical effect, at least in the sense that the natural scale is e cubed over h squared. So what that means is we've got a lot of examples of quanta that are linear in E or linear response quanta that go as e squared when I start applying a field. Um, as far as I know, this is about the first case where you get a natural scale that is e cubed. Um, and I hope there will be others. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Cool. Time for questions. Here we go. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting talk. So um, about the super diffusion. So you didn't mention, but it's related to also not just to integrability, but also SU2, yeah? Uh, so the, the KPZ, yeah. So, th so this part doesn't depend on either integrability or SU2. But yeah, here, um, I do believe that you need yeah, both integrability and some kind of non-abelian symmetry. So this non-abelian uh, seem so is there some intuition because uh, why this can survive an actual material? Because the, the theory papers studying generic non-abelian, uh, transparent non-abelian models, you know, they show, uh, they don't show any super diffusion if it's not integrable, yeah? So is yeah. this- is So I think, some... yeah, I think, there is some work on if you add a non integrable perturbation uh, up to what time will it look like this before the perturbation starts to act? And basically, the worst case would be something like, like the most important perturbation here is probably coupling between the chains. So, coupling along the chains of this material is about 30 times larger, maybe 20 times larger than coupling between the chains. Um, so, you could say, well, uh, is the onset of, you know, breakdown of KPZ, uh, does that happen at sort of H bar over J perp? Um, it, 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 there are some theory papers arguing probably not. It probably onsets at H bar times J parallel over J perp squared. Um, so one paper is by Matrunich and one paper is by Doyon, of the ones I know. So um, I see. Yes. So basically uh, you need two powers of the perturbation. So I think it it does break like down, and it's not it's not even like exponentially protected or something, but the breakdown is probably quadratic. It's like Fermi's uh, golden rule. Exactly. Right? It's what you'd guess from Fermi's golden rule. So, uh, but about KPZ, did, can you check? So uh, did you check also higher moments of the transport or? There's an interesting discussion about this. So I think, I think you can find examples that are, uh, you can find aspects of the problem that are not KPZ, most likely. I know that's been done for classical versions. Um, for quantum versions, I believe there is work not by us out there. I don't think it's like public yet. Uh, so I, I think the guess is that what I'm not entirely clear on is uh, it seems like there are some aspects that are described. So, okay, Z equal to three halves, I think is pretty rigorously established by direct calculation. 
Um, some aspects even seem to fit a KPZ scaling function, but some do not. Uh, and I think exactly which aspects are KPZ-like and which are not is not completely understood, at least by me. Okay, thank you very much. Something more about that model you constructed to see linear T? Yeah, um, the basic idea, it's, uh, there's a paper by Balenz and Fisher that was kind of the inspiration. So you could think of it a bit like, what they were thinking about was sort of motivated by carbon nanotubes. Their, their model was quite old, but what you want is something where you have strong scattering, but not opening a gap. So that's kind of the one bit of tuning you're doing is that generically strong interactions will tend to just give you a gap state and that's not as exciting. Um, so it's kind of taking a, uh, you know, write down your leading order. So it is local. It's just like, you know, Hubbard-like model, um, but the Hubbard model would open a gap. So it's a Hubbard-like model with tuned interactions so the gap doesn't open. Uh, so, for, for the perturbed Luttinger liquid, I mean, uh, so you wrote the hydrodynamics for the uh, for the energy density, right? But I guess I mean the hydrodynamics probably include uh, there are other kinds of fields which. One well, yeah. In that case, I mean, well, so I think that that's not quite the it, it, that's not quite the reason it fails. I think if I were doing okay, so if I were doing a Heisenberg chain, then I would need to keep track of those other quantities. But we were yeah here for this. When I say generic Luttinger liquid, I basically mean no other. No, nothing else is strictly conserved. Um, but I think the reason why, and the point of the simple model was, if you assume that the system was able to reach local equilibrium, then you could, you could use equilibrium quantities, sort of linear response quantities. Um, but I think the problem is that the expansion is too fast for it to reach local equilibrium. And in particular, the sign of that, you know, this solvable model uh, gives you shapes that are not Gaussian, but are kind of expanding monotonic lumps. So like if you want model of uh, sort of non-integrable Luttinger liquid, uh, assuming local thermalization. Um, it will give you super diffusion with an exponent that is just related to the Luttinger parameter. Uh, but if you look at pictures, like let's say I, I started with some lump of energy. And over time that lump spreads, but it kind of remains monotonic. So if you look at what actually happens um, with DMRG, you get something that looks a bit like a wave front. And we were not able, despite spending a bit of time on it. Uh, so in other words, you know, it, it's not monotonic in the actual expansion while it is here. And I think what that means is it's, it's not reaching local equilibrium. Um, it's also, yeah, it's not free either. Um, so exactly, you know, a good model for this line shape in the generic Luttinger liquid is something we struggled with and did not, we, we don't have one. Um, so it's, it doesn't reach local equilibrium because there are other sort of almost conserved quantities or? Yeah, something? I mean, it could be, I, I, in this, in the model we actually studied, I don't know that the other quantities are particularly close to being conserved. Like, I don't know, I don't know that, you know, the scattering uh, is so weak. Um, I guess, yeah, so I think there are two things going on. One is, you know, as it's expanding, uh, yeah, okay. I, I think maybe a way to state it that is close to what you're thinking, which I think is true, is if I were to look at like the local state of the system out here in the tail, um, it's quite unusual. It's got, you know, more right movers than left movers. Um, I don't know how to, I don't know whether it's right. I don't think that state is even local generalized Gibbs ensemble. Um, I don't have any reason to believe that, although I guess we didn't check, but, uh, but at least it's it's far from you know equilibrium, and I think it's even far from like hydrodynamic equilibrium, where you'd have a velocity and energy, as well as number. Um, so there's some non-equilibrium state, but yeah, I mean, I I think it ought to be possible. Like in this model, you know, what makes this model simple is that the state, the local state of the system is just one parameter, energy density. I think it's what we tried was you know what if you had two parameters or maybe three? Like ordinary hydrodynamics would be like three parameters. Um, I suspect that there's probably a better model that would at least do a better job capturing the line shapes, but I'm not sure if the right way to do it is to start from near integrability. Okay, one last question. 
Hello. Yeah. Um, uh, you showed this um, uh, polar this uh, circular polarization induced uh, currents which flow in different directions depending on the circularity of the polarization. What about the absolute values of the currents? Are they also are they the same or are yeah, they different? Yeah, they're the same. They have to be the same. Yeah. Um, I think at least for the symmetry class that we have studied in both 2D and 3D, they have to be the same. I don't know if as a generic statement, you. Uh, I guess the idea would be, I think that, okay, the material itself uh, has time reversal symmetry. So the only key breaking is from the sense of circular polarization. So I think going from left to right is like flipping the sign of T. So it kind of has to flip the current. So at least for a non-magnetic material, I think that probably has to be the case. Okay, and if if I may, just a very short last question. You mentioned that the AC Joyson effect is topological. Can you say what is topological about it? <laughs> yeah, so uh, mostly this is because I have a very vocal friend on the subject, Shivaji Sandhi. I guess I think the answer would be um, if I think about okay, the Joyson effect I would say is related to flux quantization. You know, it's related to H over E being the quantized amount of flux. So if you're willing, so if you like. It's because the U1 gauge is compact and it's not a line. So it's the difference between a circle and a line. If you, in other words, you wouldn't see the AC Josen effect if electrodynamics were somehow not U1, but R. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can decide how significant a difference that is, yeah. Okay, so let us thank Joel again.